Back in 2006, that's a long time ago now, Tom Brady had already made a very significant impression as an NFL quarterback. He had been virtually unranked when he came out of university to go on to become a three-time winner of uh, the NFL championship seemed a very remote possibility. But he'd done that and he was on 60 Minutes uh, talking about all of those things. And in answer to one of the questions, he said something that was surprising. There's times he said, when I'm not the person I want to be. Why do I have these things? And then I think, pardon me, and I think I need to put my glasses on. And I still think it's something great, there's something greater for me. I mean, Maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. You've reached my, I've reached my goal, my dream, my life, me. I, I think it's, there's got to be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? When the, interview, the interviewer asked, what's the answer? He said, I wish I knew. Well, this year, in February, he retired, finally, having added more championships, more reputation. He is the GOAT, as the saying, the greatest of all time as an NFL quarterback, and virtually no one would dispute that in terms of at least the championships he's won. And uh, when he was asked about his future, he said this, you need a purpose when you wake up every morning. Uh, when I don't have the purpose of football, I don't know, that's going to be a real hard thing for me. And his interview, interviewer labeled his article on him in Atlantic, the quiet desperation of Tom Brady. That's remarkable. I mean, he's rich, he's handsome, he's famous, he was married to a world famous model, everything that in terms of what a person could have, he had all of those things. And there's this sense of discontent, this sense that it's not there, apparently the epitome of the American dream. But that's not what he's enjoying and experiencing. Contentment is a great blessing, but at the same time, it is remarkably not characteristic of the time in which we live. Discontent, discontent with our politicians, discontent with our standard of living, discontent with where our lives are going or the country's going, discontent with our income standings, discontent with marriage, discontent with school boards, discontent with teachers, all of those things roll over and over in one form or another. And it's one of the strange things about life. No country has ever had more. And yet the discussion is about how much depression there is, how many young people are wrestling with those kind of things. Contentment is a very rare commodity, and discontent seems to be the defining characteristic of our age. And when you think about it, it's, on one sense, no surprise. When God put Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them everything, everything to enjoy, except one tree that they weren't to have the food on. And Satan comes in, and his point of attack is, why not that tree? What's wrong with that? And all of a sudden, their eyes were filled with not wonder at the strength of God's provision, but discontent at what they didn't have. Contentment is a great gift in the way we live life. But 400 years ago, Jeremiah Burroughs wrote a book as a Puritan entitled, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. 
Because just because we're believers, it doesn't mean that we don't have a battle with discontent. And the ally of discontent is covetousness. And so, as we come to where we are in 1 Timothy, uh, there's this interruption of Paul's discussion. To think of the people to whom he's writing and saying, let's get very practical here. So take your Bibles, if you have them, and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6 with me. And let's begin reading. We'll read verses 3 to 5, not because we're going to focus on them. We looked at those last week. But because uh, we're going to have them as a launching pad into verses 6 to 10. Teach and urge these things. The end of verse 2. If anyone teaches a different teaching, a different doctrine, and does not agree with the sound, the health-giving words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he's puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing. With these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful things that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced, actually the where it has a stronger idea, impaled themselves with many pangs. An old preacher named Henry Beecher once said, in your lifetime you'll probably see only a dozen contented faces. Well, I don't know about that count and what kind of survey he did to show that. But lasting deep discontent is a challenging thing. And it's a challenging thing in the world in which we live and act. And so Paul begins to talk about covetousness. This is a church in first century Ephesus. Not a lot of people, but even in that community, there was an issue of covetousness and a struggle with contentment. There were the rich. Remember back in chapter 2, he had to warn women of a certain kind to not wear their best jewels and fashion to come to the meeting of the church, not to come dressed up as if you were going to an important wedding occasion because there were people who were wealthy. And in verse 17 of chapter 6, he will say, now to the rich among you. So there was on one hand people who were very well off and were enjoying wealth. On the other hand, we noticed in chapter 5 there were widows who were destitute, probably with orphans, who the church had to take in and care for and be part of ministering into their lives. And then there were others who had said, if you've got a widow, you need to care for them if they are dependent on you and you're connected to them. And then there were slaves. And they looked on and observed what they didn't have. They were, socially speaking, a piece of property. And then there were the ordinary working poor. All in that mix of people in that local church and covetousness was there. And in our country, it's not any different. We get 6,000 commercial messages, we're told, every day that we're exposed to. Nearly all of them saying, more, more, or better, better. And pulling in our heart. Uh, The Los Angeles area, 
is sort of uh, place central in terms of the lavish life and the life on display. And yet underneath, there's always the quest for more for the multi-billionaires who are buying houses. I recently one that he'd bought for a hundred million to tear it down to build one worth 400 million. What's, what's, anyway, we don't need to talk about the irrationality of all of that except to say, look what I've done, look who I am. But then there's somebody else coming along and you're Elon Musk and then there's Bill Gates and you go back and forth. More, more, in all of that kind of way. And in this context, the whole thing was mixed up with the fact, as you noticed at the end, there's these false teachers, the end of verse 5, these false teachers are in the stir. And they're viewing religion and the opportunity of being with these people as a, a way of gain. They think godliness is, and, and by godly, they mean religion. Now, there was no gain by listening to what Paul was saying. By grace, you're saved by faith. Without any works, all you can do is receive the gift of God. If you want to make money off the Christian faith, you've got to change that and say, no, um, there's things that you can do to get God's pleasure. There's things that you can do to get more. God wants you successful. God wants you healthy, wealthy, and prosperous. What you need to do is claim it, but you also need to plant seeds, usually in my ministry. You, you need to give here so God will give because you've got to give it away before you get it, and I'm willing to receive it to help you out. And that message has spread around the world substituting and distorting the gospel. And it goes right back here. It's, in one sense, always been the case. It's interesting. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 2, There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. And that was already going on in the church here, and Paul is talking about it. So I want you to notice, he doesn't say it in quite this way, what he says as he is talking about covetousness and the way covetousness ultimately fails us. In, in verse 3 to 5, ultimately says that covetousness will corrupt our view of truth. It will distort the way we see God, and we will see God as our bank account on whom we draw, rather than our Lord before whom we worship. And the rich young ruler, in the presence of the Lord, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Give all you have. And he went away discouraged or broken because that was a price he wasn't willing to pay or consider. Or you think of Lot, as we'll see, because we're going to move into Abraham a little bit later, who uh, sees Sodom and leaves where God has called him to be to go seeking Sodom. You see Demas, who Paul says has forsaken me seeking this present world. And even distorting the truth in terms of altering your theology. And we see that happening in the world around us. The second thing Paul says about covetousness is that covetousness values what we can't keep. I mean, that's, I think, something of the sense of that rather interesting introduction in verse 7, having made his statement, godliness with contentment is great gain. He said, we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with this we will be content. There's something here of the words of Job, 
everything's been stripped away. He's sitting there in the presence of God, but you remember his words, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And Paul seems to be reminding us that we leave everything behind. Came in naked, we go out naked. And all kinds of things happen in between, but in terms of what happens and counts for eternity. Be content. And thirdly, he says at the beginning of verse 9, that covetousness arouses within us all kinds of temptations. For those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Saw it this week. A senator corrupting himself for money, for gold bars and bags of money, plunged into deceit. And he, from all accounts, is a return customer into the, that kind of line. And we've perhaps known people and looked at them and thought, I never imagined that you would do that. I can remember as a teenager, two guys who were maybe four years older than me, part of our church, getting into things that I, I never could have imagined, given who they were and what their background was. And over time, in different places of life, it has an addictive capacity. That's the fourth thing. When he says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Not the root, and not of all evils, but it's a root of all evils. It has that capacity of saying more, more, and all of a sudden we get into places we never expected to be. And then finally, he says of covetousness in the end of verse 10, that they pierce themselves with many goings as they wander away from the faith. But Paul's not simply condemning covetousness and warning against covetous. Be on your guard against all, covetousness, uh, all kinds of covetous, Jesus says. In Luke 12, 15, for a man's life does not consist of possessions even when he has abundance. But Paul says, in contrast, godliness with contentment is great gain. Now we need to go back to what he talks about because in verse, nine, uh, verse 5, he says that they think godliness is a means of gain. And there he's using the word not of genuine faith, but of religious faith and putting on that show. But in verse 6, he's talking about true godliness, what Paul talked about. And he said, without any doubt, great is the mystery of our godliness, of our faith. God was manifest in the flesh. And so the reality of the truth of the gospel is that God has come to live among us for his glory and that godliness is the core. But godliness with contentment is gain. Notice, godliness is gain. If you're trusting Christ, godliness is gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, the word contentment's an interesting word. It means, in one sense, self-sufficient. 
And the Stoics loved the word. It was a word of Seneca and others of the great poets who talked that the man who is a mature man and a wise man is disinterested in the externals of life around him. Whether it's people, whether it's possessions, whether it's favorite activities, he is a man who is self-reliant and totally reliant upon who he is. And he delights himself in detachment. So the very word stoicism, that sort of attitude to other things, that they don't really matter, I'm all that matters. And interestingly, it's a philosophy that's found an increasing kind of resonance in a modern time where young men are struggling in all kinds of ways. And intriguingly, for some of them, the stoicism of a Jordan Peterson comes along and draws them in in a particular way. But that's not what Paul's talking about. And Paul's not talking about a kind of resignation. It's kind of, well, that's all I can expect. And he's not dealing with a kind of attitude that says, I, I, it just doesn't matter. Or a kind of attitude that just is, I've got what I've got, and that's all I need. Because Paul knew what it was to say, I don't consider myself to arrived. I forget what's behind and I press on so that I may gain everything in Christ. No, it's not an attitude of indifference to life or complacency. Another place says, it's my ambition. Take the gospel where it's never been. So when Paul's not talking, or talking about contentment, he's not talking about complacency. He's not talking about accepting the status quo. What he is talking about is a deep inward sense of rest and peace that is found in knowing that God and his promises and his presence and his provision is adequate for what he needs in life. It, it's what Jesus is saying. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest to your souls. Contentment is soul rest. Take, take my yoke upon me, on you, and learn of me, for I am lowly, meek, and gentle in spirit. Or it's my wife's, one of her favorite psalms. It's a fascinating little psalm. Let me read it to you. It's the shortest psalm in the Old Testament. My eyes are not raised too high. Pardon me, O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with great things, too great and too marvelous for me. But I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child upon a mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. It's obviously a picture that a woman who's given birth and has had children, and for the first year, the baby wants for what it gets. But there's a time when a mother lies there with that child, now weaned, just resting and delighting in the presence of her mother. It's a very strange figure of speech for David, the king, the warrior, to have thought of. But it's a picture of a contentment. Now take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 4. Because I want to uh, pick up what he says here. Godliness is with contentment is great gain. And hear Paul talking about Godliness in a different context or uh, contentment in a different way. He's received financial support from the Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 4, he is giving them thanks for that. But he does it in a profoundly significant way. I rejoiced in the Lord that now at length you've received, revived your concern for me. <clears throat> 
for you were concerned about me, but you didn't have the opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and greed. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And many have heard that last verse, verse 13, quoted in every kind of context. Uh, I may be five foot eight and 80 years old, but I can do all things through Christ who's gonna strengthen me and I'm gonna qualify for the Olympics. Well, nobody says anything quite that absurd, but something comes, I can do all things through, but Paul's not talking about it in that context. He's talking about it in the context of verse 11. And he says in verse 11 that I'm speaking, pardon me, in whatever situation I am, to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can deal with wealth. I can deal with abundance. Not because that I'm able, but through Christ who is in me. It is his recognition that the source of contentment was Christ. I knew how to be Hungry. I know how to be abased. He's writing this letter from prison with the possibility of death in view. I'm content. I know how to be content because the source of contentment is trust in the goodness, the presence, the promises, the provision that God is making for me. And he says, I'm ready to be offered when he writes 2 Timothy. I'm ready to die because I'm in the hands of Christ. Now, I want you to notice something that becomes very significant. He says in verse 11 that he has learned to be content. I have learned the secret of being content, of having plenty, and facing hunger, abundance, and need. Contentment is learned. It is not automatically given. And it is learned in the school of hard knocks. It is learned in times of need. It is learned in times of dependence, but it is also learned in times of blessing. I know in my own life I can look at particular times and say, okay, I, lying on my back in bed as a college student wondering whether I was going to have vision because of an accident that had happened, and yet the Lord was present, and I learned I can trust him. Standing by the bed of my daughter, she was dying. And to learn that his purpose was good. And all kinds of times that are different than that. Contentment is learned. But one other thing. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. Well, we'll start at verse 5. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. 
What can man do to me? Did you notice? Contentment is learned, but it is also commanded. Be content. And that's a battle we fight. It's not an attitude that we suddenly get. But the source of that is, notice, the provision and the presence of God. I will never leave you or forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. For what can people do? A wise man said, contentment makes a poor man rich. Discontent makes a rich man poor. Be content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I preach to myself, boy, it is so easy to say all of these things and to know the grasping of my own heart and the envy that sometimes comes, the desire for those kind of things, sometimes physical things, sometimes social things in terms of status and prominence and all of those other ways. But we need to recognize the ever-present pressures of more or better. And recognize this side of heaven, they will never be absent from us. But we also need to realize the ever-present promises of God in Christ. I have learned to be content. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He will never leave me or forsake me. I want those other things. Part of me desires those other things. But where I am now, I will fight the battle of content. And clearly, although he doesn't say it in this passage, part of the battle of discontent, part of the battle of covetousness, is part of learning generosity. Of rather than being grasping to what we have, of being generous with what we have, to learn content with even a little less in that particular way. They think godliness is a way to gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Keep your life free of the love of money, but more. Well, it's not wrong to have more. And God graciously gives more. There were people who honored God, and they had great wealth. An Abraham, a Job, a, a David. But contentment is the battle God calls us to. And inevitably, the battle of contentment comes back to realizing God has given me everything I need in Jesus Christ to live a life that glorifies and honors him. There's been times where Elizabeth and I are sometimes me have been in places with people who have so much less and yet watch the joy of contentedness on their faces in an African village or in the jungle in South Africa or in a home church in communist China with the things that are going on around and to see some brothers and sisters who are content and to feel called to come back and Fill my heart not with those 600 messages that come every day in every kind of different direction. But the word of Christ, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I died on the cross for you. I will come again to receive you unto myself. Trust me.
We do that every time we come to the table, if we come rightly, to take these reminders that ultimately all that we need for time and eternity has been provided through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus. So we come to the table. It's the Lord's table. If you trust him, he invites you to take these symbols. If you've never trusted him, he invites you to cry out in your heart, oh Lord Jesus, make yourself real to me. Help me to know that you died and rose again for me. So we're going to sing a song that reminds us that all our sin was placed on him. And because it's on him, we are free in Christ. So let's pray. Father, we thank you through the Lord Jesus for all that has been given us in and through the Lord, our Savior. And we pray that as we now come to take these symbols, we would do so in a way that honors you and glorifies you. Thank you that you loved us and gave yourself for us, our Savior. In your name, we give thanks.